In this episode we'll be talking about designing less, what if we're doing it all wrong and should we be designing more for future memories from the past? And here is the guest of this episode. I'm Shirley Ryan and this is the Service Design Show. Hi all, my name is Mark Fontaine and this is a brand new episode of the Service Design Show. On this show we talk about creating more human-centered businesses. And the way we do this is by studying the success of some of the world's best service designers. On the show we talk about things ranging from customer experience and design thinking to organizational change and creative leadership. If you're interested in that, be sure to know that we bring a brand new episode every two weeks on Thursday. So if you don't want to miss anything, be sure to click that subscribe button. My guest in this episode is Cheryl Lee Ryan. Cheryl Lee is the head of experience design at Isobar and she's been named as the two businesswoman. you see in a minute why. For the next 25 minutes or so, Cheryl Lee will be talking about designing less, questioning what if we're doing it all wrong and thinking about should we be designing more for future memories from the past. If you want to fast forward to one of these topics, as always, check out the episode guide down below in the description or just stick around and enjoy the whole episode. And if you prefer to listen to a podcast version of this episode, head over to servicedesignshow.com slash podcast where you'll find this episode and other previous ones. And now, let's jump right in. Welcome to the show, Cheryl Lee. Thanks for having me. Uh, for the people who are watching this episode, probably the very first question they have is, what is behind you? <laughs> it looks scary. It's a poster that is a vintage target shooting poster, which I found in a tiny little shop in Barcelona years ago, and right. I have matching ones. All right. Okay. Okay. That's good to know that, that it's not aimed at us in, in this case. Shirley, um, first question that each and every guest, uh, guest gets is your first encounter with service design. When was that? Look, I think that in reality, the first time that I came across service design, the terminology service design was probably around, I'd say, 2008, 2009, um, which was when I went back to university. Um, but in reality, I guess, uh, you know, for a very long time, I'd been involved with designing products and services without necessarily really knowing it. Yeah. And yeah. It, it was one of those moments where, you know, when you come across it, you think to yourself, wow, there's all these other people that are thinking just like me. Uh, <laughs> So yeah, that's I, I would say that's around the time. I think so many people who are probably are watching or listening and so many guests on the show have mentioned this, that uh, you suddenly stumble upon the term and think, well, you know, is this how it's called? Is this what I'm doing? Yeah, absolutely. That's exactly how it felt. I, <laughs> I suddenly felt like I'd found my people. <laughs> Welcome to the tribe in that case. <laughs> very much. You've uh, given me three very interesting topics that we'll talk about for the next 25 minutes. Um, and you have a stack of question starters and we'll just co-create the questions as we go along. Um, I'll just pick the first one and I'll surprise you and I'll pick the one that uh, puzzles me the most. I'm really curious what you make out of this. These are not the typical service design show topics. So let's, let's, let's give it a go. This one is called progressive reduction. Do you have a question starter that goes along with this one? Well, can I use the, the, the dot, dot, dot? The wild card. The wild card? Go I'll ahead. Use the wild card. Yes. The reason that I'm going to use the wild card is because we probably need to say, what is progressive reduction? <clears throat> so, um, Progressive reduction is what happens when you consistently take things away instead of consistently adding them. And I think this is a really interesting topic at the moment because we really live in a world that is just so full of stuff. Mm. There's absolutely more stuff than you can possibly ever imagine in a lifetime. Uh, as an example, you know, if you 
if you're an Apple user or an Android user, as it may be, you go to the App Store and you look at how many apps are on the App Store and the number of the apps that are used versus the number of apps that are not used. It's just astronomical, the amount of stuff that, that there is. And progressive reduction, in my mind, is a kind of undesign. So rather than continuing to add more and more and more things at the rate that we're going, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we need to consider how we take them away. Interesting. And um, how many designers are thinking about this? Because I, I must admit, you're one of the few people that I hear talking about getting rid of stuff instead of the creating new value. So basically you're saying we should create value by removing things, right? That's exactly what I'm saying that we should try to do. Um, look, I think it's something that I'm seeing amongst some certainly UX, what I would call UX designers or detailed, de detailed designers who are working specifically with digital products. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I've heard the terminology taking things away until you cry. Um, you know, trying to take away as much functionality as possible. But I think we can go beyond that because it's not only about um, the steps that are involved or the buttons that we click or even the interactions that we have with the service. It could be, um, you know, a number of products or it could be a number of aspects of a service to, to get down to what is really the... You know, and it's it's interesting because then you sort of the, the term the term that gets bandied around a lot at the moment is um, MVP or minimum viable yeah. product. Yeah. You know, and and um, I think that that term has lost its meaning in a sense because if you really want to get to a minimum viable product, you really need to think about reducing what is there so that you do get down to the core of what is needed. Um. On a large. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think that it's something that we need to think more and more about um, because of the sheer volume of what is being created. Mm -hmm. And you know, it, when I something that, that I guess comes up in my mind from time to time is, um, you know, it's taken us 150 years to figure out the damage that we did with the, with the Industrial Revolution. How long will it take for us to realise what we're doing now mm -hmm. so so is it what is the key um to actually uh, do progressive reduction and and one of the things that comes to my mind is that you um we should consider something as a scarcity and that might be like the, the time we take away from people or the attention we take away from people what is is, is that something scarcity or how do we approach this? Look, I think there's there's lots of ways that you could approach thinking about it. Um, I have this personal model for currency, <laughs> and I think about my own currency in terms of uh, time, money, attention, and energy. And and recently, I've thought of adding a fifth element to that model, which is value. And that's the value that I receive and the value that I create for others. So, um, you know, you can certainly think of it, think of redu pro progressive reduction in terms of uh, multiple lenses. Um, you know, certainly there's the physicality and the, the visuality and um, the tangible component, but then there's what people, um, what people get from it and what they give. So, um, yeah, I, I think there's a lot of lenses that you can apply, but the really amazing thing about what's going on right now is that things are changing so rapidly that we have to keep inventing new ways to think about problems. Hmm. And um, and I guess right now this is just something that's really on my mind in terms of in terms of what we're doing. Ultimately, if I could get to a place where I said to a client, <laughs> they probably wouldn't want to hear this, but um, we don't think you need that. Yeah, that yeah. would be that would be really amazing. And and they would pay you the premium price for that, just for that <laughs> advice. 
Yeah. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> so and the, the, the thing um, I'm really interested in is, you know, there's a lot of probably uh, a lot of examples of stuff we don't need, but do you have some good examples or things that inspire you that have applied this uh, mindset in a good way? Oh, geez. Yeah. Um, that's really hard because I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sure, and maybe that's part of the reason why it's on my mind that that I'm not seeing that a lot in in certainly the things that I have. Um, what I can say is that I've be I've definitely become a lot more discerning with what I use. Um, so I recently bought myself a new suitcase. Uh, I bought a it's a I've got matching congratulations. Suitcases. Thank you very much. <laughs> matching suitcases, very special. Um, they're both Victory Knox suitcases, uh, and it took it took quite a while to figure out which was the right. I know this is crazy, but I'm a designer. It's okay. Um, it took quite a while to figure out which suitcase was the right one. I travel a lot, so making sure that I have the right suitcases. And I should also footnote that with I I would probably call myself a design nomad, so I don't necessarily have a. Even though I spend a lot of time in Hong Kong and some time in Melbourne and, and um, across Asia Pacific. Um, I haven't really had a, an apartment of my own very permanently for a long time. So, you know, I live out of a suitcase. Um, so my, my two Victory Knox suitcases <laughs> are pretty well designed in terms of what they are. That's interesting in itself, right, for luggage companies to think of themselves as something else. Hmm. <laughs> If people would like to know more about this, you know, is there a resource you can refer them to to read this or things that inspire you? Um, I th look, I think that, th that there's certain, certainly an element of this that has come from the thinking of um, an example would be the, the minimalists. Mm -hmm. um, they've got a documentary mm -hmm. on Netflix. That's a mm -hmm. good starting point, mm -hmm. I think. Uh, I certainly follow them and a few others um, related to them on Facebook, mm -hmm. and um, and I, I really enjoy what they what they post, which is kind of ironic in a way that a designer would be minimalist. But design has gone through minimalist phases before, and if design, say visual design, could go through a minimalist phase, then I don't see why experiential design sure. can't go yeah. through. Yeah. as well yeah <clears throat> i can recommend the book by edward de bono simplicity i guess it's also a classic in this uh, in this case let's move on topic number two uh <clears throat> hmm, hmm, hard to pick let's <laughs> let's do this one topic number two is we're doing it all wrong and uh, again if you want to use the wild card feel feel free where is it? Oh. We're doing okay, it I'm, all I'm wrong. With this one. What if? What if? We're, we're doing, doing it all wrong. Okay. What is it? <clears throat> what is it? I, life. We're gonna get. We're gonna get really philosophical right now. <laughs> so, um, you know, I don't. I. For some reason, there there really isn't a day that doesn't go by where I don't wake up in the morning and think to myself, "What if we're doing this all wrong? What if what if this is not how we're meant to we're meant to do things?" And I think um, you know, from a from a design perspective, this is something that's probably really propelled me towards design my whole life. You know, trying to fix things, trying to make things better, and I, it's a question that I think about and, and I guess I don't want to say meditate on, but I definitely probably overthink around, you know, if, if we were doing it wrong, what, what would the opposite of that look like? You know, what would, what would it look like if we were? Um, and so, what are your yeah. ideas on that? <laughs> well, I don't know. I just, I feel like, you know, um, it's, Again, it's this. It's it's quite a contrast, or yeah, it's quite a it's quite a contrast to being a designer, because you know, 
the, sim- the, the act of being a designer is about bringing things into the world. And, um, you know, I find myself wondering, you know, were we, were we actually given everything that we need and we're just not doing it right? So the act of creating more and more and more and filling people with all of these amazing things is that actually taking something away from what we're supposed to be doing? Is it distracting us from the things we're, we should be doing? Maybe. I def- well, look, definitely. Um, you know, you only have to, <laughs> you only have to walk down the, down the street and someone will be on their phone walking towards you, um, completely zombified on their phone, um, you know, I mean, you know, we really are quite consumed by the things that are around us. So how, uh, how, does, what, how does this translate into the things you do as a designer? How do, how do, you, is, do you have a way to, make, to put this into practice or is this something that's alive in your head? Um, it's, look, it's definitely, it's definitely something I think about when I am designing. So... Um, you know, it really pushes me to think about the human perspective, really get into, I guess, into the mind and into the shoes and into the the being of of whoever it is that I'm designing for. Because, you know, um, without that, there's it's almost it's almost not not worth designing for. Mm, mm, you know, mm. or not if we're not intentionally designing for the betterment of people's lives, um, I think we are doing it wrong. So this, this is, um, how would you influence young designers or people that are uh, getting into design education today? You know, what, what would you say to them? About this particular topic? Yeah. Um, look, I mean... I think I think it's really amazing. So um, I'm not, I'm not exactly sure where it is. I I want to say it's in Sweden, the the Museum of Bad Design. Hmm. You know, have you heard of this? No. Okay, so there's a there's a Museum of Bad Design, and I think it's super interesting that um, you know that that all humans can recognize, in a way, at least on some level what bad design is we know when something doesn't work the way we want it to we know that it feels a bit weird um so you know i think that getting young designers to consider alternatives consider other ways of of doing things that maybe playing by the rules is not necessarily the only way to approach design Mm. it's a really important part of their their development. It certainly was mine. I mean, you know, I spent a long time trying to design the way that other people wanted me to. And um, I guess after, after, you know, getting things wrong many times, learning from what I did, getting it right sometimes, <laughs> having things never go to market, you know, um, I, what I've, I guess what I've come to realize is that there are no rules when it comes to inventing the future. <laughs> So, you know, that, that, that's, that, that will be probably the title of this episode. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm getting from, from what you're saying right now, and uh, I think this has been on one or two episodes in the past, is that um, maybe good design is way humble than it is today, uh, as in it's uh, less visible, it's almost transparent and um, yeah, it's not... It's not getting in the way of us being us. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's it's interesting that you left the last topic to last because I think we're going to move into this. <clears throat> there we go. Third topic. And it's called experience or memory. All right. So for oh. this one, hmm, I might have to use the wild card again. Go ahead. You'll be the first guest who uses the wild card twice in an episode. <laughs> Sorry, I, I, I know. That's, that's so experience cheap. or memory? What is the uh, question? Um, are we designing for experience or memory? 
So uh, there is a there is a psychologist whose name escapes me. <laughs> um, who did a fantastic TED talk, and I will give you the link. Uh, well, included in the description. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, and he very specifically talks about the present self and the remembering self, two kinds of selves, which I think is very, very interesting. And the way that our present self experiences things in the moment. So, um, for example, when you're using a product, um, you're experiencing in the present. And then the remembering self is about your memory of the experience. So I'll give you an example of this that happened to me last weekend. So um, uh, me and my partner, we, were, we, were, we went to an art exhibition out in the country. We came back and we went to an antiques warehouse that was out in the country. And we walked in and I was like, you know, being a little bit minimalistic minded, I was quite overwhelmed by the amount of stuff that was in this place, which freaked me out. Meanwhile, he was running off, looking around everywhere, and he screams out, Nintendo 64! <laughs> 64! So this is a really interesting space to think about because whilst a Nintendo 64 now doesn't necessarily have any real present experience value there is a value in the memory of that experience so he values the memory of the experience he probably wants to play vr to be honest now but the memory of his experiences with nintendo 64 have stuck with him all that time you know 25 years later or whatever it is and i think this is really powerful and do you think Nintendo was designing for that back then? No, I don't. I'd, I'd be very surprised. I mean, someone, please tell me I was, I'm wrong here. Um, I think they were designing for the present experience. I don't think that they were designing for the, the you know, when, when I say the future experience, it's the future remembering experience. That's getting really meta, right? But <laughs> imagine how powerful that can be, Um you know, designing something for memories. I think Disney is probably a good example of designing for memories. And then you kind of get into a space where you're thinking about what I would describe as constructive, constructed experiences like Disney, which is where you have this constructed experience that is built for memories and more of the authentic present experience that we are creating today when we're making products and services and so on. So um, there's, a, there's an interesting interplay between these things. And um, I think that there is an opportunity to strengthen, certainly for brands, to strengthen the relationships that they have with people by creating present experiences that continue well beyond into the future and the remembering experience that people have. It's like sort of building a, a heritage or something that you yeah. remembered about, right? And, and, baking well, that into, is, and baking that into your design process. So this is a really interesting thought as well. So again, going back to this, this antiques warehouse that we went to, the things that we create today don't necessarily have that heirloom type um, quality the way that things used to. Hmm. So um, uh, we're designing things that – we're not designing things that last. We're designing things that change. So we used to design things that would last, and now we're designing things that change because we know things are going to change rapidly. So there's no, there's no keepsake that we have anymore except for the experience that we have, the experience that we remember. And do you think, um, will we grow up as a generation that won't have anything to point at in 30 years to, to show, to make our memories tangible? Because everything changed? Well, think, well this is the thing. I, I wonder if we are, but the things that we will have are the things that, that, represent those memories so for example you know instagram social so, social media 
they're the types of memories that we have now that we hang on to that we carry around with us um you know it's funny it, it's actually one of the reasons that i that i'm i do get tattooed now um and have done more than i have ever before because um because i am such a nomad in the way that i work and i i live i can't carry things around with me you know here i am saying my my beautiful beautiful suitcase is designed <laughs> so well um, you know my suitcase this suitcase won the red dot um, in 2016. So it, it generally, genuinely is a great design. But again, my tattoos are something that I can carry with me. I, I don't have to have a, a poster like this that I yeah. lug around with me everywhere I move to. I have them on me. So, um, you know, um, experiences are, are intrinsically tied to memories that we carry around with us. And now we're carrying those memories in a completely different way than we used to. Yeah. Interesting. And how will how will companies be remembered in 10, 15, 20 years, right? That's, that's a quite powerful thought. And I don't think a, the big brands, with a, a few exceptions, are, are bothered with this. I, well, it's interesting because, you know, they say, you know, they say at the moment that the average life cycle is 15 years for a for a um, um, a, a brand and mm. their success and and succession um, and with um, the rate of exponential change that will decrease and decrease and decrease so creating experiences that are designed for the future remembering self are important because that will last much longer in the mind of people than the experience that they have in the present. And to be honest, the present experiences are becoming so, I guess, much of a muchness. There's not, you know, there's only sort of small differentiations between different types of experiences. And they're being driven by, you know, by those major players, whether it be Google or Facebook and so on. So there's a same sameness that's happening in design at the moment, but I think that designing for the far future, not in terms of this is the technology for the far future, but rather designing for the way that people feel and remember things, mm -hmm. that is a way to differentiate experiences, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really good uh, closing to this third topic and um, I'm sure you know, there are people listening to this episode or watching the, the video and uh, this is your opportunity to ask them a question. Is there something you'd like to know, something that puzzles you? Um, I think I'd love to, I mean, I'd love it if other people would send their answers to these questions because I would love to read Actually, I do have a question then. Go ahead. Are you, think, are you thinking like this too? Am I the only one who's thinking like this? Or are there more of pe are there more people out there thinking like this? Because I find that sometimes I feel isolated in my thinking. And I'd love to know that there's other people who are thinking in... Uh, I guess intellectual ways. Real, real intellectual ways. Um, you know, I don't want to sound like a, a complete jerk, but, um, you know, are there any other design philosophers out there? And are, are, they really... watching, are they watching the show? And that's the big question. <laughs> yeah, are they watching the show? And if they are, you know, we should all, we should all connect because these are the types of questions and thinking that I think will push design to a place where it really can change the world that we live in. Thanks so much uh, for sharing, uh, Shirley. It's, uh, it's been a pleasure to have you on, to have this uh, conversation and to, to have a, a small look inside your head. So, Thank you for having me, Mark. And um, I can't wait to hear the answers to the questions. <laughs> me neither. <laughs> so let's wrap up this episode. So what is your biggest takeaway from this episode? And what is your answer to the questions Shirley asked? Leave your thoughts and ideas down below in the comments. 
And remember, more people like you are watching these episodes and your comment might just be the thing that helps someone to get his next meaningful breakthrough. If you're interested in learning more, check out some of the past episodes or head over to learn.servicedesignshow.com where you'll find courses by leading service design experts that dig deeper into the topics we discuss here on the show. I'll see you in two weeks time with a brand new episode. Thanks for watching and see you then.